May, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, from Sardan and uh, all the people who have gone to so much effort to get this poor body across the, across the world to give this presentation. Um, first of all, I've got to say that I'm from the laboratory. I'm not an IT person. And right from the word, uh, right from the word go, when I got the title of LIMS, I said, is that LIMS or is it LIS? Is there a difference? And I said, I don't know. So bear with me. I am not a definitions person for LIMS or LIS. Here it is. Um, so bear with me on from IT or definitions about do you mean a managed information system or an information system that's managed? I don't really know, but this is what I want to be. And what I want to do is give you an idea of where we are in molecular pathology, at least in Northern Ireland. And so what I want to do today is really give you an overview of what we're doing, of putting our laboratory in the context of our regional demands and then map the complexity of what we see as the limbs that are required to meet that demand. So I'll identify the purpose and the aims, the pre-analytical, analytical, post-analytical demands. Test validation is very important. Our accreditation bodies will come and have inspected us and will ask for our validation processes before implementing for diagnostic testing. That same process is now coming from clinical trial uh, monitors, the MHRA in the UK has just sent us out a survey asking us about what we're doing about testing for clinical trials, either uh, to support primary or secondary findings. And then looking at handling complex systems such as tissue microarrays and NGS. And then they need to identify what we have got to interface with systems that we have got in place. And it, interoperability, platform, compatibility, whatever you want to call it, it's got to talk to systems that are regionally in place that have been set up uh, elsewhere in order, to report, in order to develop and establish a simple report that's understandable to the clinician to avoid diagnostic errors or interpretive errors. And then I'll summarize, hopefully, what we've done today. So uh, in Northern Ireland, we've got an integrated health care, health and social care uh, approach. For a population of 1.8 million, geographically, there we are in the northwest of the country, northeast of the island of Ireland. And uh, crucially for us, we are separated into several uh, trading boards, or uh, trust boards, as we call them. And each one has, an, has a, the responsibility to deliver primary and secondary care to that region. And we as a regional service have to cater for individual needs within those trusts. And uh, what we do is we report on lung cancers and adenocarcinomas where we reflex test for TKI treatment, ALK treatment, ALK inhibitors, and more recently with pd one and again, with, we've extended that to squamous cell carcinomas for PDL1, and we did that in a three-month dash for validation because the treatment came very quickly and was paid for very quickly. Uh, the same with colorectal uh, carcinomas uh, for RAS, BRAF, MSI for Lynch, and MMR testing. Again, UK guidelines have extended that to all colorectal cancer patients not just those under 50. So we've got to cope with that expansion. Um, melanomas for BRAF and NRAS. Uh, breast HER2, both on the in-situ hybridization and the immunohistochemistry, and the, particularly in the gastric HER2 IHC setting. So you'll see there that we're not just talking about molecular pathology, NGS. You talk to people outside the laboratory, isn't molecular NGS? Well, yes, but it's also therapeutic immunistic chemistry and in situ hybridization. So in Belfast, what we've done is put the laboratory into as part of a comprehensive uh, research setting. So we're getting diagnostics and research in the one setting, but we're doing the research in the diagnostic uh, standards so that we have bringing up the discovery process, a translational process into 
a reproducible, accurate, and an acceptable standard. And we've published the concept of this as the integrated Belfast model, uh, as you see there. And it's not just integration of institutions and body, but integrations of technologies. And this is what I call uh, a, a glass poor data rich environment, but it still has glass in it. It's just not taking scraping it off and getting rid of the glass completely. It's a mix of the two, a hybrid where we still have the glass because PDL1 requires pe uh, people experienced in uh, looking at the glass and interpreting. Whereas at the same time, those same people are looking at DNA and reporting on the uh, bioinformatics pipeline that's coming from that as well. So we've again published uh, widely on various aspects of that in digital pathology, information management, in situ hybridization, integrating the molecular tools in histopathology training for uh, pathologists, uh, what we call the Belfast model, why not? Uh, Immunistic chemistry should undergo validation. Again, what do we mean by validation for today's uh, accreditation systems? Um, both in cytology and histology, and then bringing that together and working with a repository, the Northern Ireland Biobank, which provides ethics and it provides materials not only for translational research, but for service development because the material is there and we have ready access to well-defined, robust clinical data that we can have put forward things like PDL1 testing in a three-month process because the material is there and we can track that through. And I do use the word track visedly because today our tracking system is a pen and pencil or paper. And what we want to do is bring that over into the electronic arena to track it, but then also to manage that system. And as I say, what we want to do is put that under an accreditation system uh, the diagnostic accreditation system in uh, the UK is UCAS. And of course, we have to participate in uh, QA, and again, we use UK NEQAS systems for that. So we have uh, the clinical, the research, academic, academia, and industry partners. So we perform more than 1,000 clinical tests, more than 5,000 research tests. We've published widely. And we have industrial collaborations with PathXL, Philips, Almac, Randox, Serdan, and others. Uh, we're performing in clinical trials, and we've got a new teaching program for routine pathologists and molecular pathology. So that's really where we are. And I think that that's a snapshot of where a lot of systems are, or pathology departments are, not necessarily the one place, but collectively, where they're all trying to do the same thing. And ho ho uh, hopefully this will encapsulate the complexity that each one faces individually and what we face as a profession uh, collectively. So why would we want to do it? Well, we want to improve accuracy and efficiency. We want to show that our records are accurate in the tracking. We want to be more efficient than having to get the pen and paper and then go through pen and paper as, as part of the audit process. Whereas we all know that computers are great at doing audits for us, where with the spreadsheet interrogation or bringing together that data can produce that odd data very quickly. So it'd be more efficient to do it electronically. And as I say, to meet accreditation requirements, we need it for clinical. And more and more clinical trials are asking, what's your limb system you use to generate the data as part of your primary or secondary findings? and then in research reporting. Again, I was at the meeting at AACR uh, a while back, and the first thing that we were wanting to talk about was wh how did we uh, look at accrediting uh, research programs, the discovery process, and how do we validate tests that are then going into biomarker uh, development. Uh, the aims of any limbs must account for the workflows, the documentation, as I say, the auditing, the technologies and the analyses, the various forms of the things that go together to present reports that have to be either interface with or be compatible with existing systems that are part of the analytical process or as part of the post-analytical report itself. 
So if we map the complexity of the LIMS interface, we have to look at the technologies and workflows. We have to look at the pre-analytical, where we are evaluating the sample and the annotation of samples. We're looking at the analytical, I say like the validation <laughs> process, where we have uh, also then the reporting of single biomarker, uh, but with multiple forms of reporting it, or we have multiple biomarker and data-rich reporting pipeline systems. And then in the post-analytical, how do we report NGS results, the digital analysis of digital imaging, and then how do we interact with the biobank to retrieve samples and then look at and curate that robust clinical data that's going to support our findings and generate something as simple as a Kaplan-Meier curve. Diverse cytech technology. So in the laboratory, we have the, the basics, such as the, you will find in any pathology department AP system, where you've got sample preparation of processing, embedding, microtomy, microscopy, uh, automated systems to generate on slides. But then we move across to extracting DNA through automated systems, manual systems, and then laboratory testing for single genes, or for targeted gene panels, or for uh, multi-gene next generation sequencing. And then taking it across, not only on the DNA, but the, the epigenomics, the methylated DNA, and then uh, expression arrays from the RNA. Pre-analytical aspects are the key uh, 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 input as to what you get. We've seen diagrams today, rubbish in, rubbish out. That is no uh, more important than in pathology. And we recognize that we have to get a handle on simple things such as fixation and standardization of processes. So as a referral center, who are taking material from other centers, we have to have a means of recording what their fixation process protocols are what their uh, in-house fixation systems are. We can't, don't call them, oh, we use a standard processing system or a standard fixation system. We've done the surveys in the past in pathology, we know there's no such thing as standard. Some will fix for 16 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours, etc. We need to know that one laboratory at 16 hours and a laboratory at 48 hours, they're sending us their samples and our uh, analytical processes is going to generate a correct result. We need to record and sa re uh, curate the sample requests from the various formats. So it'll be in formal and fixed paraffin embedded blocks, formal and fixed paraffin embedded sections, there'll be plasma for CF DNA analysis, and we need to take the specimen reception from various centers such as clinics, clinical trial units, and they're not necessarily in the same country and then QUB, our own research PIs, have their own particular research interests, including small animal work. So we need to record and curate, microdissect. Uh, we need to record the DNA extraction uh, metrics. And we need to look at tumor content, annotation cellularity. And the annotation tumor content has been touched upon uh, maybe with something, something like from Foundation One. Now, if you are sending something to Foundation One from a, on a tumor, they will want a minimum tumor content of 20%. That's their requirement. If you're wanting to submit something to the Cancer Genome Atlas, it has to be 80%. If you want something that's going to be done on a laboratory basis for qPCR, we can see it's 10% or 20% or 30%, depending on the test. So first of all, we have to know the purpose of the downstream application and just to know what the tumor content has to be. And then we have to find a way of establishing what do we mean by tumor content and how do we assess that accurately in a reproducible manner. And this is some work which we've done in the past uh, with Peter Hamilton well, as, a, as an academic in a previous life. Uh, but we're, what we're looking for here is identifying a means of assessing tumor content in a robust manner. And in this paper, we describe how the three or several pathologists, shall we say, don't agree 
on looking at the same uh, content. I think it's well established that pathologists will call 10% uh, tumor in one, uh, and another pathologist looking at the same image or the same slide may call it 80%. And what is right, what is wrong, and how do we establish that through training? Or how do we establish that through a quantitative system? Um, what we were trying to do here was set the basis for a quantitative system in lung adenocarcinoma and to see how it, uh, first of all, uh, improved on the reproducibility of the tumour content. And that's important to us, particularly as to the downstream testing, not only in addressing for uh, other centres, but for our own testing metrics. Uh, for example, if we were putting a system through an ion torrent, we know that we can handle something for 2% tumour content so if we now move to the analytical, we have to think about interfacing with digital pathology, and we've seen a lot of that this morning and this afternoon. Um, and we have to record and validate the technologies. In the UK, this is UCAS, and this is the ISO standard 15189, which we have to abide by. And we have to account for single protein and gene biomarkers. And that, as I say, is both glass and uh, liquid handling. So immunes to chemistry, in situ hybridization, and single gene technologies. If we want to do multiple protein, multiple gene biomarkers, this we have accept that's complex data management through high throughput technologies. So if we look at interface with uh, digital pathology, um, the Philips scanning system has been shown this morning as one, and if we scan that, we can then see that using the IntelliSight system or something similar, a pathologist can look at it and manually give a diagnosis, or in our case, uh, manually annotate, or send it off to a quantitative system where we want to know how many cells are in it, uh, how many, um, uh, what is the tumour content, uh, if it's an IHC, what's, you know, what's the key 67 count, etc. Uh, and so we then have to use the quantitation, so we have to think about the different scanners, and we have different scanners on site. We have to use different software, the Finians, Helio, Visio Farm, we know of others. And we've just recently developed in-house a freeware uh, CRUK Accelerator Grant funded project through open source software called QPath. And I think M Morris was going to talk about this. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to give us an idea of this. But briefly, um, this is a software which, w which has been developed under CRUK. And really, I'm using this to give you an, an, an illustration for those who aren't familiar with digital quantitative pathology of what these sorts of programs need to do. They need, they need to, first of all, establish that there is tumour there, that there's, the protein is present. Uh, it has to provide some sort of TMA support, tumour ID, some fast analysis. It has to be user-friendly. And obviously, we want to use image and automated image analysis. It has to estimate or quantify some sort of analysis, uh, data support, and it has to export onto different formats, either PDF or Access spreadsheet, and it has to be obviously interactive with different uh, platforms such as Windows, Apple, or anybody else who comes along to provide a, a Windows operating system. So with, with the idea that we've got the, the slide based, we've also got then to account for image to chemistry and in situ hybridization. But again, it's just not simple image to chemistry because we've got uh, single biomarkers but m complex multiple reporting. So we've got a report such as ALK where it's either positive or it's negative. But we've got something like HER2 where it can be 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. It can be on a TMA, it can be in a whole section. And in, in the case of HER2, if it's a 2 plus, then it needs to go for in situ hybridization. Uh, this is a chromogenic in situ hybridization. 
there's a fluorescent in situ hybridization, and so on. So again, the complexities of how these are managed and how, how these things are reported has to be accounted for in any LIM system. So this is an example of our validation process. We've published on this a couple of times. This just happens to be the one for cytology because it's simpler, it's modified. And what we're saying that immunistic chemistry has to go through a validation process as if it was a molecular technique. So molecular technology has to have knowledge of the source. So in this case, it has to have a source of the antibody. And if it's well characterized, then you should be transferring and trying to develop a protocol. If it's something you've developed yourself, an antibody that's been developed, then you need to find out an awful lot more about it before you even get to the, the testing stage. But once you're into transferring it onto a validated protocol and you've got that up and running, then you can proceed to clinical validity. If it don't get that far, it has to be rejected. And this, and this unfortunately, is probably where a lot of immunistic chemistry stops. It looks pretty, it looks good, therefore we'll use it. But what we're saying is you have to ensure the clinical validity. In other words, is it going to be part of a panel? You've already got 10, 10 immunos react, uh, you're looking at as part of a lymphoma panel. Now you've got 11. Is it adding to it? Is it taking part? Is it taking away? Is it saving you looking at two of those? Therefore, you're reducing it. That's value. Is it adding something that the others do? Then, by all means, add it to it. But if it's another key 67 marker, or if it's another BCL2 marker, why do it? And so on. And of course, it then has to be reproducible and has to be accepted as part of a, a quantitative, uh, sorry, a qualitative uh, assessment. But then it's, that's just not the immunistic chemistry, which is the last based, but also the single gene markers, single reporting uh, in the liquid uh, phase. We've also got different workflows. These are just two examples of single gene uh, mark, uh, reporting. One is a black box system for qPCR. It's, in this case, it's a Roche uh, Cobas. And all that's saying is you've tested this DNA and we've found a mutation. In this case, and it's an EGFR, L858R, job done. On the other side, we've got Sanger sequencing. And in this case, what we are looking at is the actual gene sequencing for that, around that gene hotspot for L858R. And we can pick, do a pictogram and we can see the chromatogram showing us where the mutation is and the actual, actual base change occurring from a, a T to a G, or whatever it may be. So um, we've got two systems of technologies which have to be encapsulated in any limbs, and those have to be different workflows, of course. One is done in two hours, the other is done over two days. And now we come to the big beasts, where we're looking at multiple uh, protein, multiple gene biomarkers, where you're generating data. Uh, now I, whether it's tissue microarrays or whether it's next generation sequencing, to my mind, it's data. It's bits, terabytes, petabytes, whatever your unit of measurement may be. And that has to be managed and it has to be curated. And how, not only in the, once it's generated and the bioinformatics pipeline, a lot of, inf lot of energy has gone into looking at training bioinformaticians uh, looking at bioinformatics pipelines. But well, what do we do to manage that and bring it back to generate an intelligible report? In the discovery process and in the uh, validation process, we're using things like tissue microarrays. So tissue microarrays, for those that are uninitiated, are means of generating uh, multiple samples on the one last slide. So you're getting a high throughput technology, so you can do 60 or 100 uh, cores from different tumors or 60 tumors on the one last slide on a machine that might stay in 30 slides. So instead of just doing 30 tests, you're doing 30 times 60 on a full machine. So you can imagine that you're getting 600, 6,000 results from a three hour process, which then has to be measured uh, quantified, interpreted, and reported. 
and you're getting a high throughput system just similar to what you're getting with data from NGS. You're, you're cutting down the wet work from six months to six days or six days to six hours, but you're coming to this logjam of reporting and the quantitative analysis systems are there to help do that. However, that has to be managed. And what we're looking for is a system that can then take that tissue microarray and manage that and then bring across the, the clinical data. At the moment, this is done in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, there are automated uh, systems out there which generate the spreadsheets automatically alongside the uh, generation of the physical TMA. So it, it shouldn't be too uh, difficult, I would imagine, then to make sure that the mapping of the cores then can be put into your limbs through a compatibility exercise. And it all has to be mapped and recorded then. So that's TMAs. This is next generation sequencing. So if we have next generation sequencing in a research program, what we're doing is we're selecting clinical samples and we're getting the best sample quality and we're doing NGS analysis. And if it's discovery, we're making that analysis as broad as possible. And then we're confirming the bits that we're really interested in using orthogonal methods and then we're taking selected reporting of those results and that's our discovery process and we've done great things and th th that, that's, that's all well and good but what happens if we change the word research to diagnostics the clinical samples then becomes whatever is available it has to be targeted as been indicated this morning eight genes or, or eight portions of genes. It's not eight genes, it's eight portions of genes or eight hotspots of genes or 16 hotspots of eight genes or 32 hotspots of eight genes, whatever way the clinical sampling is. But it's really eight aspects of those genes need to be targeted because those are the ones that are treatable. Those are the ones that the oncologists want to know about so that they can treat the patients today or not to treat and start chemotherapy or whatever it is. And we cannot keep confirming with selected findings because we can't go back, or oh, we find this result, let's confirm it again with using orthogonal. We have to have a robust validation to show that when we get a result, we stand over that result, we don't need to repeat it, and so on. Selected, well, we're selecting in the process of targeting the gene in the first place. So what, what we're saying is uh, we're published on this that the next generation is that we have to change a paradigm in molecular diagnostic validation. We cannot afford to validate every single gene finding going forward. We have to validate the testing. So we have to decide on broad versus deep. Do we look at more genes or with uh, less sensitivity? Or uh, look, do we improve the sensitivity with less genes, as we would do for clinical, where we want to get a minimum read, minimum sensitivity. Therefore, you you want to get a very sensitive, uh, you want to get a high sensitivity uh, with deep reads. Uh, do we need reference standards? And you know, in the uh, diagnostic world, what does that add? We don't. Do we need the germline in order to take off or compare against? And turnaround time and cost. It's okay, all well and good, if you have a, the best NGS system, if it takes three or four weeks, the patient cannot survive, literally, for three or four weeks on that result because their condition for TKI, for example, for lung adenocarcinoma, their performance data is going down day by day and you need that result in order to know whether they're fit enough to, to respond to TKI treatment if they're uh, valid or viable in the first place. And then cost, do we look at one sample at a time, 50 samples at a time, 100 samples at a time? Do we batch? But if we batch, then we increase our turnaround times to match the cost. We need to balance those two opposing things. So, and then as I say, we need to look at the pre-analyticals. And those things need to be recorded and 
again, our accreditation systems ask us retrospectively what went into your decision-making process. How did you come about? You wanted to look at those genes with that turnaround time. Did you talk to your users? Show me your records. At the minute, we've got a pen and paper showing that, how the record is done, whereas a LIMS would have that done and, and uh, curated and sent, and uh, it's so much more efficient, we would hope. And again, when we come to reporting NGS, is this an activating or an inactivating mutation? Does the mutation engender sensitivity? Uh, how do we select therapy in the case of multigenomic alterations and so on? So again, when it comes to NGS and reporting, we have to have management of levels of certainty, or is it levels of uncertainty we need to manage? And this is just one of the, a diagram in one of the papers. And really on the left-hand side, as I look at it, you look at it, um, actionable, therapeutic, where it's uh, either FDA or guideline approved, those are probably about the eight targeted genes that we're talking about. The rest of the board is either the ones that are online, which may have the potential, but the clinical trials haven't been completed, or as you move further to the right, it's the unknown, it's the discovery. And so those are the ones which are, may have implications further down the line where we need to start the clinical trials. And all of that in our setting, we do all of those, and so all of those need to be captured and all of those need to be some way uh, monitored for when we come to uh, report the clinical trial results at the end. So we need NGS validation for clinical trials, clinical samples, and research purposes. And so what we have established is a reference set and, and reported on that, and then extended that to clinical samples, and this is the benefit of our system in that we have those clinical samples going through every day. They're readily available and they've already been tested using orthogonal methods. And now we can compare our targeted panels. As we bring in new ta targeted panels, we can add it to the pipeline and then uh, have those results and compare it with, with systems already in place and say, is this an improvement? Is this better? Is it worse? Does it add value? or should we keep on the track that we've got? And just, we've uh, done this multiplicon panel, that was part of a clinical trial, and that was what we were reporting to the AACR. We are nowhere near starting that clinical trial. It'll be another year before we have the clinical trial. But you know what, the NGS has been validated, and we know that once we start testing it, the panel is fit for purpose, because that's the panel that has been designed for that clinical trial. And again, that's on paper, and it is literally, the results are on paper, because that's the only way we've got to record them and keep them in one place. Whereas if we had good limbs, uh, curated systems, managing that, that's what we would be looking for to part, uh, to enhance our, our uh, capability to improve our efficiency. And then finally, we reviewed and designed compatible bioinformatic pathways uh, to bring that bioinformatic pipeline together. And then we look and report on the ver ver variants for therapeutic candidates, the key variants, because those are the ones that are interested today. And then what we do, now NGS is complex, not only because you're looking at, is it single gene, multiple genes, uh, is it whole axome, whole genome, whatever it is. It's also different library preps. So you've got different companies are producing different libraries. So you've got to record those different libraries. You've got the same library going on two or three platforms. The same library could go on an ion torrent platform or it could go on an Illumina. We've got both and there are two Illumina platforms. Currently, we're getting a third, the MySeq, NextSeq and the HiSeq or NovaSeq, you know, those are different workflows which again need to be uh, undergone with the limbs and recorded. And what we're looking for is that sort of limbs that can be plugged and played and designed, that sort of system. So I think bringing it together, the general rules of engagement for limbs and NGS is we need to 
capture the sample type is a long, small, difficult biopsy with small tumor content, poor DNA quality. Do we do multiple genes in that, or do we just cut the chase and look for EGFR, and that's it? Or is it a, a research where we just can ignore that and take the best sample that can, we can get? We need to evaluate that. We need to evaluate it reproducibly and with accuracy. And we know, need to know what type of DNA's preparation has gone into that, where it's automated, what flat form, and what is the DNA quantitation. In the analytical, we need to know the prime library preparation, the quantitation, the sequencing, the pipeline, and the result evaluation. And then we have to put the report into context and the curation of the data. Post-analytical and for limbs, then, is really the clinical interface for reporting, the research interface, data management, and the biobank. So this is our interface with uh, clinical reporting. At the moment, there's us in the middle uh, as a referral laboratory to these hospitals, the regional onco oncology MDTs, and our own hospital, which is just across the road. But geographically, these might be across the whole province, but we have a simple management system. This is the simplest that we can get. It's Word. Uh, we, we create Word files. We physically copy and paste or use a template, put it into the system. It's very primitive, but it works. It means that we report it. The oncologist has, sees it, or the pathologist sees it back at uh, uh, the other hospitals, and that works. We have this interface uh, between our, lab our laboratory and our clients. Northern Ireland has an electronic record system on all patients. It, not, it interfaces with that. So once we put that in, it just doesn't go on to this system. It also goes on to the Northern Ireland electronic record, the care system. So any limbs that we bring in has to have either complements this or enhances it. Remember, we just don't do anything to replace something for nothing. What's the benefit of adding to that? So if we have a lens for modern molecular pathology, it has then to put that in a more integrated manner than just a word-based system, ideally. From the, for the IT people, each trust in our department have, have their own firewalls, each of which have to be overcome hopefully through uh, password protection. And uh, again, this is something that the LIMS has to be acknowledged and to be allowed to do that has to cross over from our university system into the trust or Department of Health firewall. We have uh, some data management systems in place. Uh, this is one, again, that's been developed in-house called PCAN. And really, what it brings together are the images from uh, our TMAs, our scores, our cl clinical data sets, and produces them then in a, a, a friend, user-friendly manner. And if any, we're bringing in from adding into this the limbs of, for digital pathology, the limbs for uh, genes. It has hopefully bringing that together because this then manages our metadata bringing across from uh, the clinical pathology, uh, the, such as the staging, uh, the actual diagnosis, SNOMED coding, etc. And then finally, interfacing with the biobank. Uh, biobank, it too has its own limbs. <coughs> so interfacing with the biobank then has uh, patient consented. They're immediately given these CPRID numbers. Those then generate uh, consent forms, the patient's notes. Uh, it can be a blood sample, which again generates numbers and generates different types of samples. Uh, normal fresh tissue, fresh frozen tissue, and FFPE samples. These are normal and tumor, and you've got blocks from each of those, again, identifying that. And the idea, end result, you've got every item relating to the patient's blood, 
sample, whether it's the plasma, whether it's a tissue block, and then record the exactly where it is in the system. And then whether who's taking it out, for what purpose, and it's done for ethics. So in summary, any limbs for a modern molecular pathology unit really has to improve the accuracy and efficiency of the system while meeting the accreditation standards for diagnostic, clinical trials and research purposes. So the aim is to develop a limbs for modern molecular pathology consideration with consideration of the pre looking at the fixation, the tumour content, nucleic acid QC metrics, the analytical, or it's single marker, single multiple reporting, or multiple biopsy, uh, multiple biomarkers, with a complexity of multiple functional rule. That's just not the H and E, but digital pathology, either manual assessment or quantitation, NGS is a glass base, glass poor or glass rich uh, environments, uh, and the post analytical. The clinical report, clinical trials have to be compatible systems that are already there. We have to interact with those. And we have to interact with the biobank because they are the curators of the metadata, which is so very important to produce the, the type of the results that are robust and clinically meaningful. And I just want to then thank everyone back at base um, from the technicians uh, through to our postdocs and pathologists, research fellows, etc., and our supporters uh, in funding and our industry collaborators. So thank you for listening. <laughs>